Hi, this is Dr. Pawan Gorakanki. I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor and also director of Yeshada Group of Hospitals. Uh, welcome everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening and night, depending on whichever part of the world you are. We welcome you to this uh, great session online. Hopefully we are uh, at the tail end of this COVID season. Uh, by now people are probably, I'm guessing, sick and tired of uh, wearing these masks, masks and PPEs and uh, seeing the same patients over and over and uh, CT scans too. So at least in Hyderabad uh, from uh, this month or so, I think uh, we are seeing less and less COVID patients and hopefully we are at the tail end of this and uh, we can go back to our regular pulmonary work, uh, particularly the interventional uh, pulmonary stuff all of you are missing, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, today's talk uh, is, you know, is about the endobronchial ultrasonography. Uh, particularly the linear uh, linear EBUS, we'll be discussing uh, quite in detail and all you want to know about this. Uh, uh, so now ultrasound, as you know, has uh, become so ubiquitous and it's essential in almost everything like uh, ultrasound guided central lines. Almost everything nowadays, uh, people do it ultrasound uh, guided, uh, then like uh, just like 2D echo, chest x-ray. I think uh, in the future, the uh, EBUS is uh, assumed uh, is a prerequisite skill for all pulmonologists and I would strongly urge uh, uh, the new graduates and even the older uh, pulmonologists to be up to date with the subject as in future though, this will be become a, almost an essential part uh, I'm guessing. Uh, we have uh, organized a beautiful uh, guest line of speakers from all over the country and the world uh, leaders in their field uh, like Professor uh, David Fielding from Australia, Dr. Melvin Day has come so many times here too from Singapore, Dr. Paul Frost Clemenson and Dr. Ida Skogart. Hopefully the pronunciation did not uh, do too much of a disservice from Denmark. Dr. Kyle Hogarth from USA, Dr. Angela Takano from Singapore, Dr. Royal Virhoven from Denmark, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajadar and uh, Dr. Ajay Wag from USA. Besides that, we have uh, the leading luminaries, as I said, from all over the country. And uh, this is a two-day session, and uh, I think uh, you'll cover pretty much everything, about whatever you wanted to know about the uh, EBUS from basics to the advanced stuff. Just briefly about uh, Yashara Hospital. Uh, yeah. Yashar Hospital is a single city-based uh, hospital in Hyderabad with three branches now about uh, 2,400 bed and uh, expanding to we are building a new hospital upcoming in high-tech city about 2 million square feet uh, facility and uh, from the beginning uh, Yashar Hospital was uh, a leader in multiple fields like uh, even from the beginning uh, whenever the first uh, multi-slice CT come we were one of the first to introduce the rapid art technology for precision radiation, pre-test line, intraoperative MRI and uh, like liver transplants, more than 100 uh, you're doing nowadays besides other fields. But in particular, though, uh, pulmonary and intervention pulmonary in particular, uh, we, are, uh, we are pioneering in the country, I would say. Uh, besides that, uh, COVID-2, like we discharged uh, more than 8,500 8, patients uh, till date. And we had uh, close to 350 critical care beds, almost continuous occupancy for at least two or three months, and including uh, probably 150 ventilators. ECMOs and all kind of things uh, with COVID-2. And uh, coming to the topic of interest, uh, pulmonary and intervention pulmonary are especially strong and uh, keen to pioneer whatever is available here. So we were, uh, like besides uh, linear and uh, radial versus and other uh, interventional pulmonary procedures, uh, bronchial thermoplasty are uh, doing one of the highest numbers in the country. Uh, we had launched the vapor ablation for uh, COPD uh, recently and then uh, navigational bronchoscopy uh, besides other things. Uh, but uh, take this opportunity also to people here in the country especially know that we are extremely glad that we are uh, starting a proper heart and lung transplant program uh, particular right in time for COVID and post-COVID patients too. I'm thinking uh, uh, you know, we are lucky to get one of the best in the world uh, Professor uh, Kumun Ditan. Uh, he has come from Australia, relocated here specifically for its purpose to lead our heart and lung transplant unit. Uh, an extremely qualified and skilled doctor uh, uh, besides uh, sitting in the 
chairperson in multiple uh, transplant societies, uh, being involved in hundreds of lung transplants all over the world, including UK, Italy, UPMC, Australia, and all with uh, good outcomes, especially pioneering work uh, about the donation by cardiac death, next we go transplants, uh, lung transplants, uh, and also the being involved in the first donation by cardiac death, uh, heart transplant, and uh, highest such series uh, involved in 50 of them or so. So he'll be joining us and we'll be running a full fledged program from October 15th or so and uh, people in the country can uh, definitely make use of his services and I'm particularly glad that uh, right in time for this COVID and post COVID situations too, he may help. Uh, and a lot of effort has been put by all of our pulmonary team uh, here in uh, Yashal hospitals, uh, all the three branches, in particular Malakpet uh, branch or uh, newest and uh, latest dynamic doctor, Dr. Vishweshwaran will be leading this uh, organized, uh, uh, this world-class set of doctors from all over the world. Uh, and he will guide you through the program. Uh, besides that, all our other pulmonologists also contributed uh, their lot and particular thanks to the team in uh, Malakpet too. As I said, uh, EBUS is a very essential skill, I think in the future and almost everybody should uh, be at least aware of uh, uh, what exactly is uh, lymph node stations, how to do the, how is the ultrasound picture and uh, you know these things uh, uh, need uh, some practice and skill for the full development but for the basics though I think it's great to have a sessions like this where you know the basic anatomy and basic uh, scheme of how to do and what to expect uh, these kind of things before trying it in a real patient too and for uh, patients already doing e-buses too uh, like uh, this session again uh, it gives us a chance to talk and interact with uh, experts in the field from all over and uh, clarify any of your doubts uh, and uh, so much for my talk. Uh, thanks for listening and I'm sure over the next two days you'll have a wonderful time uh, going through everything you need to know about uh, e-buses and uh, from here on uh, uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran will be leading you through the program and uh, our leading luminaries from all over the country will also be introducing the foreign uh, delegates too. So next session uh, will be Dr. Vishweshwaran and he will be talking about uh, mediastinal lymph node imaging pulmonologist perspective. We'll start from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pawan, sir, for the introduction and uh, welcome you all for the second edition of the International Interventional Pulmonology Virtual Meet. This time the theme is on uh, linear EBUS. We will be having uh, the series of uh, lectures for next two days by the best of the international uh, faculties who are experts in each of these individual domains in EBUS, uh, which will then followed by a panel discussion on the at the end of the second day, where we will deal with the real life uh, challenges, which will be discussed uh, by the eminent uh, national faculties. So myself, uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran, and I'm working as a consultant interventional pulmonology at Ashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad in India. So I will be starting off the session with a talk on uh, linear EBUS and overview. So I don't have any financial uh, disclosures to make or any conflicts of uh, interest. So linear EBUS, as we all know that the ultrasound imaging in pulmonary medicine can be carried out in the form of a transcutaneous ultrasound or it can be in the form of an endoscopic ultrasound or it can be in the form of an endobronchial ultrasound which we call it as the linear or the radial EBUS. And tissue sampling is often indicated for accurate neuronal staging as well as the diagnosis of a tumor. And as per the international consensus guidelines, the lung cancer staging, the endoscopy, endosonography in the form of a EUS and EBUS should be the initial tissue sampling test over the surgical staging. So this makes the role of a EBUS and a EUS much more than the surgical staging in when you are staging a patient with a lung cancer. And both EBUS and EUS have a complementary diagnostic yield and when used together can increase the yield of your samples as well as help in achieving a better diagnosis. So just a few words about the linear EBUS. The linear EBUS was introduced in the year 2004. It allows for an ultrasound guided transbronchial needle biopsy which we refer to as the EBUS TBNA. It can also be combined with the strain imaging techniques in the form of a real-time elastography which will help in predicting the 
site in the node where your needle has to take the cytology sample and it can also be combined with enhanced Doppler techniques which helps in clearly identifying the blood vessels thereby avoiding these blood vessels and improving the yield of your cytopathological diagnosis. And real-time EBUS TBNA has got a higher diagnostic yield in mediastinal staging than the blind TBNA and has got a similar sensitivity to the mediastinoscopy and hence it is preferred over your mediastinoscopy because it is a day care procedure and number two it is associated with the less complications and it is easily available. Moving on to the indications, the indications can be classified into those that are related to the suspected lung cancer where your EBUS can help in sampling enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes for a PET positive mediastinal lymph nodes as well as it can sample those tumors which are adjacent to the esophagus or to the airways. It can also be used for the staging of the non-small cell lung carcinoma where you can do a mediastinal staging regardless of the nodal size at CT for PET positive lymph nodes and even if you find a significant lymph node with a short axis greater than 10 millimeter but PET negative these nodes are to be sampled for an appropriate staging of a lung cancer. It is also used for a mediastinal restaging after neoadjuvant therapy, for suspected mediastinal tumor invasion, and for suspected left adrenal or celiac lymph node metastasis. It can also be used for the evaluation of the mediastinal masses, which may be a solitary or a multiple, and for suspected mediastinal metastasis of extrathoracic tumors. It is also used in identification of the benign disease like tuberculosis and sarcoidosis, and in malignant conditions like lymphoma. So moving on to the uh, technical aspects of the EBUS. The picture what you see is on the left side is of a typical EBUS where you have got a probe. At the end of the probe, you have got an ultrasound transducer as well as we have got a dedicated channel through which a needle enters. And this helps in the real time visualization of the needle passing into the node and taking the uh, samples from the lymph nodes. There are multiple manufacturers which produce uh, EBUS equipment and understanding these configurations is very important before you set up an EBUS unit because each of these scope differ in their diameters, working channel, the field of view and the frequency what it can offer. So this is a picture which shows the mediastinal lymph node stations. As we can see that the, those lymph nodes, which are, those stations which are shaded in the green are those which can be accessed by means of your EBUS TBNA. While those which are shaded in yellow can be accessed by means of USFNA and those which has got a combined shading with the green and the yellow are those which can be accessed by means of an EBUS TBNA or by means of EUS FNA. This is a picture which clearly shows those nodes which can be accessed by means of an EBUS. This comprises of the right upper paratracheal and left upper paratracheal lymph nodes, the lower paratracheal lymph nodes, the subcarinal nodes, the hilar nodes and the interlobar lymph nodes. This is an excellent uh, Diagrammatic representation uh, courtesy Professor Paul Frost Clemenson from Denmark. So what are all the landmarks which you really have to identify when you are dealing with a case with the EBUS? The first and the foremost landmark on the right side what we have to identify is the Asaigos vein. It is this Asaigos vein which differentiates the 4R from 10R which has got a significant impact while staging of patient with lung cancer. So any lymph nodes above the azygos vein falls under the 4R, while any lymph node below the azygos vein falls under the 10R. Similarly, on the right side, what you can see when you focus the, uh, approximate the probe against the uh, left-sided lateral wall of the trachea, when what you see between the aortic and the uh, aortic arch and the pulmonary artery is the 4L lymph node. And when we further move down the scope and approximate it against the carina, what we see is the subcarinal node. And we further go down into the left main bronchus, what we, the node what, that we see below the pulmonary artery is the 10L node or the left hilar node. So this is again a, dia a diagrammatic representation of uh, uh, what we see in um, uh, diagrammatic representation of what we see in the EBUS. On the left side, you can see a picture where when your scope is approximated against the carina, what you see is the uh, subcarinal lymph node and when the probe is placed around one centimeters above the uh, one to two centimeters above the carina and it is approximated against the lateral wall of the right lateral wall of the trachea at just above the azygos vein what you see is the four or the right lower paratracheal lymph node if the scope is placed similarly on the left lateral part of the trachea the node that we see between the aortic arch and the left pulmonary artery is the 4l or the left lower paratracheal lymph node 
Further, if you move down the scope into the sec and approximate it against the secondary carina, the node what we see is the interlobar node or the 11, station 11 lymph nodes. So similarly, as we do the EBUS, the same dedicated EBUS scope can also be used for as a US scope, which is what we refer to as the USB FN. There are multiple landmarks which, which help in identifying the structures when we are doing this uh, procedure with the same EBUS scope. So again, courtesy Professor Paul Frost Clemenson for this excellent di diagrammatic uh, representation. The first and the foremost structure, what we see, as we see in the left, as we see in the lowermost uh, part of this diagram is the liver. Then you try to identify the iota and what you see is on the left side is the left adrenal gland. And as we move the scope, Keffel head, you can localize the subcarinal node and in few instances, you can even localize the, <coughs> excuse me, the paraiotic lymph nodes. So this is a table which shows all the lymph node stations which can be accessed by means of a EBUS. This comprises of the upper paratracheal region, the prevascular region, the retrotracheal region, lower paratracheal region, the subcranial region, and the hilar lymph nodes and the interlobar lymph nodes. The lobar lymph nodes, subsegmental and the subsegmental lymph nodes can still be accessed by means of a radial EBUS with the TBNA, but however, pushing a conventional uh, linear EBUS probe to such segments is difficult and cumbersome. So this is a diagram which shows the systematic approach for the staging of a patient with a suspected lung cancer. As we can see from this diagram, the tumor is on the right side of the lung. So when we have an access to both EBUS and the EUS or with the help of a USB FNA, the concept behind this is that you should always target a site where you can get the diagnosis at, as well as it can immediately stage the patient for lung cancer. So if you have a USB FNA, the first and the foremost site, what you will target is the left adrenal gland. And if it comes positive, you have both the diagnosis of lung cancer as well as it will automatically upstage your cancer to the stage four. If that is negative, in this case, since the tumor is on the right side, we will try to target the left side at mediastinal lymph nodes, which, which is N3 lymph nodes in the form of 4N and 10N. If even that is negative, then we will target the N2 lymph nodes. And even if that is negative, then we target the N1 lymph nodes. And even if that is negative, we target the lung tumor so that we have got a diagnosis of a lung cancer. So this systematic approach staging can help in uh, immediately identifying the tumor, uh, uh, type of the tumor, as well as it will help in immediately staging the uh, lung cancer in the same setting. So while doing EBUS, there are a few lymph node characteristics which we have to uh, understand. So when you, when you do an EBUS, you categorize the lymph nodes based upon their size, the shape, the margin, the echogenicity, the central hyla structure and the coagulation necrosis sign. So what you see on the left side is the heterogeneous lymph node and what you see on the right side is the central hyla structure. And on, again on the left side you have the coagulation necrosis site and on the right side you have a well demarcated brown lymph node. So these lymph nodes can characteristics can help in differentiating between a malignant lymph node and a benign lymph node. As we can see from this paper, the presence of a round or a oval shape as well as the coagulation necrosis sign increases the, the predictiveness for a malignancy in comparison to a benign lesion. Similarly, round and distinct, distinct margins as well as the heterogeneous characteristic of the lymph nodes are more predictive of a malignancy in, as comparison to a benign mediastinal lymph node. But however, in a TB endemic uh, region, the presence of a coagulation necrosis sign and heterogeneous architecture, echo texture of the uh, lymph node may not always represent a malignancy and TB should always be ruled out. So moving on to the last part of the talk, what are all the complications that are associated with the linear EBUS? The risk of complications associated with the linear EBUS is in a real setting is almost negligible and it is very rarely seen. But however, these are the uh, complications which can be expected while doing a EBUS TBA. One, you can create a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. When you rupture the artery, you create a massive bleeding. It causes severe cough. <coughs> Excuse me. It causes an infection in the form of mediastinitis or mediastinal abscess, RV edema and or hypoxemia, respiratory failure or arrest. And when you try to push the scope into the left narrow left main bronchus, it can cause left main bronchus, laceration and even needle fracture. The minor complications include 
bleeding at the puncture site, the cough, fever, bradycardia, hypotension, and so forth. So the complications associated with the USFNA include infections in the form of mediastinitis, mediastinal abscess, pleuropericarditis, pneumonia, and sepsis, mediastinal bleeding and hematoma, and esophageal perforation. While the minor complications associated include abdominal and or chest pain, fever, sore throat, and strain. Thank you, and I will end my presentation uh, here. Thank you, Vishweshwaran. You have given an excellent insights into the pulmonologist perspective of EBUS, the mediastinal lymph nodes. And now we have a session by Professor David Fielding, who's a director of thoracic medicine, director of bronchology and interventional pulmonology at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital at Bristol in Australia. He's also a treasurer and a board member, World Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology. He is a board member of Asia Pacific Society of Bronchology, and his main interests include EBUS, narrowband, autofluorescence bronchoscopy, pleuroscopy, and pleural ultrasound, also a robotic bronchoscopy. Presently, he is undertaking PhD studies by the University of Queens, Queensland on the topic of uh, specimen obtaining for molecular biology of lung cancers. His extensive experience of doing EBUS in malignant mediastinal lesions is uh, known to all of us and he is going to give us an update on that. So over to Professor David Fielding. Uh, hi everybody, um, I'm David Fielding. I work at the, uh, direct, at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital in, in Australia. I'd very much like to uh, thank you for allowing me to do the uh, presentation today and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about EBUS TBNA for malignant nodes. This is the outline of the talk. I'm just going to talk about um, some practical issues to do with um, specimen collection for mole molecular testing. I'm going to talk about some lab issues and also the future. Uh, what are the ways that we might be able to further maximise uh, the types of specimens that we can take and how we can maximise quantity of DNA to do things such as whole genome and whole exome sequencing. So molecular analysis is of course very important in treatment selection for patients with lung cancer. And at the EBUS TBNA procedure, technical factors can improve the amount of malignant tissue that is obtained. It is true that we have a variety of media that we can collect material for um, cell blocks, which are still really the gold standard uh, for obtaining uh, sections for uh, specific um, genomic uh, information, uh, particularly EGFR mutation testing. But there's an increasing um, option there to move away from uh, formalin processing because of the problems that uh, formalin itself can cause in terms of getting a, a good yield of uh, DNA uh, that's, that can be tested for the mutation, in particular, therefore, the potential role of uh, liquid media. Um, also, just to highlight the, the use of rapid on-site examination in the procedure room, because uh, studies that have used this have uniformly shown uh, exceptionally high rates of positivity for uh, the possibility to perform molecular testing, particularly EGFR mutation testing on samples. And it is important to understand what your lab is uh, doing. Uh, in terms of how the specimens are processed. I do draw your attention to this um, summary uh, paper by Sanchita Roy Chowdhury, um, which is listed at the, at the bottom of the slide. So when we're doing EBUS CBNA, it's important to consider the likely uh, pathology beforehand, whether it's adeno or squamous or small cell, and I'll, I'll go through why that might be important. It's important to sample the full width of the lymph node and avoid necrotic areas. It's important to avoid excessively vascular areas and we can adjust the needle technique for that. It's important to turn the suction off before the needle comes back out of the lymph node so that you don't contaminate the slide with epithelial cells. And it is also very helpful to use the rose um, outcome in the procedure room to allow you to maximize um, the amount that's going to go into the cell block as opposed to, for example, taking too many slides. 
it's a, it, another simple point to make is that we uh, need to be careful in the way we prepare the row slides and a key factor there is to use the stilet or very controlled um, air uh, blowing of material onto the slide so that not too much gets on the slide and to place the material in the correct position. Uh, it's important to understand that um, lymph nodes have a somewhat heterogeneous spread of malignant cells through the node. And this paper by Noriaki Kurimoto goes back to 2008 and it was a histological study of, of resected lymph nodes looking at the distribution of, mal of malignant cells within the node. And very importantly, he showed that around 25% of lymph nodes, um, two centimetres or less, only have um, malignant cells at the periphery of the lymph node. And that's because of preferential flow of cells in the lymphatics into the subcapsular sinusoids and then in, later into the parenchymal sinusoids of the node. Further, he showed that if necrosis is present, it'll be central. And that's uh, particularly in squamous cell and small cell carcinoma. And finally, that some adenocarcinomas have a so-called discohesive or single cell um, scattered uh, distribution uh, diffusely throughout the lymph node. So this, um, this uh, slide just shows this importance of understanding that some nodes only have uh, malignant cells at the very periphery of the node. And therefore it's important that the needle does actually get to this um, uh, point. This is just making this point about the, the discohesive um, uh, lymph node um, spread of, of malignant cells. So um, it, it just means that therefore the entirety of the node, not only the uh, distant end of the node, uh, needs to be sampled. So therefore we say the needle has to go coast to coast across the, the full width of the node. And you can see the needle going quite uh, close to the, the perimeter of the, uh, of the lymph node in that um, movie. We tend to um, subtly change the angle of the needle by um, just making slight thumb up and thumb down um, maneuvers with the uh, bronchoscope to further increase the uh, sampling of the node and uh, of course uh, turn the suction off uh, before we come out. Sometimes uh, lymph nodes, even though they're very large, can have necrotic centres and surprisingly we, we wonder why we didn't get malignant cells. And the way, one of the key ways to uh, consider this is to look at um, the vascularity of the lymph node. And I draw your attention to this paper by Nakajima from 2012, where he described the types of pattern of um, Doppler vascularity of lymph nodes. And the bottom two, um, particularly the high blood flow uh, type nodes, the ones that one can anticipate viable tumour cells. But the top two, one might think, uh, had um, that was therefore showing evidence of, of lack of vascularity and therefore the presence of uh, tumour necrosis. So therefore what we need to do is actually seek out the small vessels in the node. So there's a kind of natural tendency for us to think that it might make a, a somewhat bloody sample or um, that it might be somewhat of a risk and therefore to avert away from the small vessels. This movie shows, shows a normal anatomical vessel outside the lymph node in the center bottom of the picture. But you can see the smaller um, typical uh, malignant um, capillaries uh, in, in, within the lymph node, parts of the lymph node that we actually need to actively um, access because it's in these areas that the um, malignant cells are sitting in perivascular tissues. So you see the, the by contrast, the large anatomic um, vessel um, outside the lymph node, which of course uh, we avoid. By contrast, there are some nodes that have just too much vascularity and very uh, classically, uh, we see uh, malignant clear cell uh, carcinomas um, or melanoma in, um, in Australia is a very common reason for this problem. And we can sort of anticipate that this might be the case. And 
in these situations, um, we, we need to make some small adjustments. We tend to use smaller, like a 25 gauge needle as opposed to a 21 or a 22 gauge. We might only do three agitations and we would typically avoid using um, suction in those cases. So that just summarises the ways that you can, you can adjust um, in those circumstances because the, the sample um, could well still have malignant cells with as few as three passes with no suction. So as I've mentioned, the, the necrotic nodes, we, we can look um, and sort of anticipate on phenotype grounds, if you like, you know, for example, a large central necrotic mass, such as this uh, squamous cell carcinoma, we can anticipate that the, um, that the node will have this, this paucity of blood vessels within it. So this is the, the sort of the other extreme we have a big obvious node, and this is just artifactual Doppler uh, imaging, but the bulk of that node is, is quite uh, necrotic. So in those cases, you tend to, we, we might tend to surprisingly look for a somewhat smaller node. If you have a PET scan beforehand, you can use that to look for those parts of the large deposit that are viable. But, but alternatively, it may be better to adjust for a regional node that's a little bit smaller, but more likely to have viable uh, tissue. And importantly, if you start the procedure and you, you're getting um, negative samples, then you, you can switch early to a different uh, position if necrosis is coming back. So just in summary of this part of the talk here, we're looking for the, the sort of numbers of vessels that are just right. So there's small, um, you know, uh, dotted throughout the lymph node, some, somewhat um, convoluted vessels we can see but um, importantly the message is don't avoid those small vessels uh, because that, that's where the um, malignant cells will be and as I've mentioned one can look at uh, sort of a phenotype if you like of different clinical types of cancer so you've got the metastatic renal cell you've got a, a necrotic squamous cell You've got a clinical small cell and a clinical adenocarcinoma. Um, and as I've mentioned, those, the, the metastatic renal or melanomas will have, have to be adjusted for um, uh, the very vascular nodes versus adjusting for the necrotic nodes in squamous type uh, cancers. So we're, what we're doing at the moment, we're, just, we're taking uh, on-site samples with DIFQUIC and, a PAP, and PAP slides. We make a cell block using normal saline, um, and this is uh, from this FFPE sections are made for immunohistochemistry and also um, a panel based testing for EGFR mutations. We have a 24 gene panel um, in the hospital. Uh, we do PDL1 and ALP and ROS uh, immunohistochemistry and FISH in those cases where there's um, equivocal testing. In our clinical studies, uh, we're take, in addition to that, we're taking liquid medium um, samples for cell block using either methanol or RNA later. And we use taking additional dip quick slides and I'll explain that in a moment. So just to mention once again, that if we talk about maximizing a good, um, and trying to get maximal material for molecular analysis, we're seeking to have rows to facilitate this. And this was summarized in this uh, very nice paper by uh, Jane et al. And this, this is two papers, one by Yamas and other by Trisolini, which showed that um, if in the presence of rows, that there, there were extremely high uh, rates of um, adequate tissue uh, for molecular analysis um, in EBUS tBNA specimens. And um, in general, uh, th this is a very important reason to, to try to have this um, on hand. Uh, these, the following slides are courtesy of my uh, good friend and colleague, Alan Hodgson, who's our senior lab scientist. And it's just to, to say that there's, there's good and bad slides and, and it makes a difference because um, we, we first of all need to get a good quality row slide 
And secondly, we don't want to overuse material on the slides that would otherwise end up in the cell block and therefore be usable for molecular analysis. Even simple things like the, the amount on the slide, you can see the amount on the left is too much and the, the amount on the right is, is uh, too little. And particularly with putting too much on the slide, uh, that contain many, can contain many thousands of cells, which otherwise would be best placed in the cell block pot. Furthermore, you can put it in the wrong place and end up uh, having it um, lost onto the uh, label of the slide, as you see on the, on the top left. And you can put uh, too much of it, and when it's smeared, it can actually end up being lost over the side of the slide. Um, and furthermore, if there's too much, the material tends to all get bunched up and, lay and layered on top of one another, and, and interpretation of the morphology is very difficult. Just to talk about the way that we can use rose slides to triage specimens um, in the uh, procedure room. Uh, most centres would take both a dip quick and a PAP slide. So the PAP is used for morphology in the lab and the diff quick um, is stained in the procedure room. And we can take a, typically take a, a cell block pot, which is just normal saline. Well, some centres are just using a uh, liquid medium for molecular analysis and cell block in some cases. So if we, if we go ahead and do the procedure and the first pass is positive on rows, then, and, and we've made a PAP slide, for example, um, you, you don't necessarily need to take any further slides and the remainder of your passes can solely go into the saline pot for the cell block for the histopathology and, and or molecular analysis. And you can typically go up to five or six passes. So the last uh, four or five passes um, can be utilized specifically for that. But if, if the first two, uh, two or three uh, or even four passes are negative on your rows, uh, you have to just accept that, uh, first of all, some of the best material will, will be on those slides and therefore lost to the cell block pot. And you have the option, therefore, to change up to a different lymph node. And you might want to start doing that a bit earlier if you feel that despite a really good localization of the needle, things are still negative. Just to talk about uh, liquid media uh, as opposed to using normal saline and uh, formal and fixation to create cell blocks. Um, a number of uh, centres purely use liquid media now. Um, and uh, this um, paper by Docs Tater et al from last year um, shows these very nice uh, flow diagrams. And in essence, um, the, rather than using saline, they're using uh, a cytolite solution uh, or methanol. And from this, a cell pellet is created. And uh, they still have the dip quick and, and pap stains, um, which are facilitating the procedure. But then from that cell pellet, they first of all create a thin prep slide, which is um, used to determine how much uh, material um, would be therefore uh, available for um, taking um, both fish and elk uh, tests directly from the slide itself and also from the specific part of the pellet that's going to be used for next generation sequencing. And so, so that thin prep slide, which can be automatically made in, from that pellet, uh, is very informative in these cases and very simple. And then in addition, a cell block can be made and, and conventional immunohistochemistry uh, can be performed. So it's just a very nice way to maximize um, all of the options in one uh, cell pellet, uh, which is preserving the cells uh, maximally. This paper uh, by Magnini, um, shows the way that liquid-based uh, cytology does have uh, very good concordance with uh, conventional um, formal and fixed um, specimens. So currently um, in Australia, we, um, we are doing basically the tests for EGFI mutations and looking for ALK and ROS uh, abnormalities. And 
there are, of course, uh, research uh, programs that are looking at uh, more extensive uh, molecular testing. We first looked at eBus um, as a source of um, samples for next generation sequencing and found that it was, of course, uh, very feasible. And this was at a time when a lot of uh, papers were just talking about resected specimens or uh, CT core biopsies. And the idea that cytologic preparations could be used uh, for next generation sequencing was relatively new at that time. We used the 48 gene um, analysis. And in that paper, we were looking at the way that um, DIFQUIC slides could anticipate how much uh, material uh, was going to be present in the cell block. And we were classifying the amount of um, uh, cells on, uh, on the DIFQUIC slides and correlating that with the FFPE uh, samples. But what we found was actually that the, the DIFQUICs themselves very often actually had more cells and more potential DNA than was present in the cell block. And we went ahead and did um, extraction of the actual slides themselves and um, sequenced that and showed that uh, the mean DNA yield was very high, um, you know, over uh, 1,700 nanograms um, on the DIFQUIC slides compared to uh, 440 nanograms um, on the FFPE slides. And we, we showed also that the, the extent of molecular alterations that were detectable there for, uh, from our DIFQUIC samples when we sequenced them with the 48 gene panel was more extensive than the FFPE sections. We, some slides had enormous amounts of DNA, like this one had seven micrograms of DNA. And this is another case where a single slide was able to, to uh, allow EGFR mutation testing and um, demonstrate more extensive information than was, um, than was available just from the standard of care FFPE section. So we showed that it's, it's possible to complement um, the lab work by using the DIFQUIC slides and in those cases where the DIFQUICs didn't work, you could sort of rescue the situation going back to the old um, sections on the cell blocks and therefore end up with very high rates uh, across the board of, um, of a potential for uh, taking the um, molecular tests. So that's just looking at panel sequencing, but we know that um, in the clinic now and across the world, databases exist which tell us how many um, options there are in terms of choosing particular therapies for molecular drivers of lung cancer. And this is just one database, it's called OncoKB, and it's a precision oncology knowledge base. And it's one of many databases that accumulate these big vast amounts of information. And for example, in lung cancer, uh, they've been able to show that uh, from large series, um, nearly 70 or 80 percent of patients uh, do have molecular anomalies when broader testing is performed, for example, with whole exome or whole genome sequencing or with large panels. Uh, but that only um, around 30 to 40 percent of these patients actually receive molecular uh, directed therapy. And so, so this, so we're in the era now where we're trying to step off into broader whole exome and potentially a whole genome uh, sequencing. So how much uh, material is needed? You can see there that, um, that for panel testing, um, the, the, not very much is required, but large panels and whole exome sequencing are certainly possible with, with um, EBUS tDNA samples. And indeed, whole genome sequencing is increasingly being demonstrated to, to be feasible as well. Although it's technically more, they're technically the same, but because of the higher requirements, it's not as frequently possible as, as some of the earlier uh, methods. This is the type of data that's generated where we can see genomic signatures across the full width of molecular uh, tests uh, from EBUS tDNA samples. This is where we're at at the moment. We have a saline pot and a PAP slide for morphology and cell block and sectioning. But uh, this is where we could get to once more study is performed to try to validate these um, other more advanced techniques. 
And where tumor content is high, one might uh, be able to perform whole genome sequencing. Where it's intermediate, one might be able to perform exome or, or nanoscreen um, sequencing. And where uh, the DIFQIC has low amounts, it still may be actually more than conventional uh, cell block testing. And we may be able to do panel sequencing on the slides themselves in the clinic. And definitely this type of work is being done in centres, um, in, in selected centres across the world right now in, in terms of the use of um, uh, do quick slides. Just a few words to finish. Um, tumour mutation burden, we know that it reflects the likelihood of higher amounts of immunogenic uh, proteins and that potentially such patients who have high tumour mutation burden might be more amenable to uh, response from immunotherapies and therefore molecular tests such as exome or whole genome that can demonstrate this might, might um, be useful. There's some ongoing uh, controversies about the use of this depending on the type of panel, whether it's a large panel, exome or indeed whole genome, what, how many um, mutations per megabase in the sample are, uh, should be used, the cut points uh, for or cut points at. Uh, which are the eligible mutations uh, from smaller panels that contribute to the score of uh, tumour mutation burden? That's really not been fully established. And we know that if you select some populations, you might get a different uh, result for, for the tumour mutation burden, uh, depending on which part of the tumour you sample. It is likely in the long run that many of these controversies would be uh, solved by whole genome sequencing. And so the, the, the context in which it is used uh, remains. At the moment, it, it's, it's most likely putative benefit will be in, in um, anticipating uh, response to immunotherapies. Just to say a few words about circulating tumour DNA, there's a lot of excitement about this. Um, and in particular, as I've indicated there, it may be more reflective of the genomic landscape of the whole tumour because of this pop problem of selecting population cells uh, within um, a lymph node sample. But of course, it does require a lot of specialised um, lab testing and the availability of that around the world at this time is, is somewhat heterogeneous. And, but I think that we as clinicians need to be um, and are aware of this as a future part of our diagnostic armamentarium. And I, I point to you to this uh, very nice review by Liam et al in respirology in the current issue. And in that, the, the putative benefits of this, of this use of liquid biopsy or cir for circulating tumour DNA are very nicely represented, represented in some very clear diagrams. And in particular, where tissue biopsies are not available or insufficient, then the liquid biopsy could very well become a very nice alternative option. It's very interesting to consider that the stage of disease informs the likelihood that circulating tumour DNA is going to be useful in a given patient. And as you might expect, a bigger volume of tumour means more tumour in the, in the circulating blood. It might be that there's some sort of phenotypic way that we can come to understand to which tumour phenotypes, big, medium or small, uh, are we likely to get um, a positive result either from our EBUS tDNA sample or circulating um, tumour DNA. And this is something for us to consider in the coming years. Uh, just lastly, um, it, it is of course very useful for uh, looking at uh, disease progression uh, during TKI therapy. And this is a very key aspect of, um, of, of this liquid biopsy uh, in, in complement to our EBUS tDNA sampling. Just a few last words about checkpoint inhibitors. Um, our indications are the same as pretty much anywhere, uh, that they're increasingly used across the board. Um, and pdl one testing is still important for us to consider. It's not mandatory to have a high pdl one test to allow the prescription of uh, these therapies, but um, it is still important for us to consider particularly in the future as we try to pick which patients are likely to respond. And there's two or three very nice papers. This one from Cicada looked at um, 
patients who had surgical uh, specimens and compared it to their uh, EBUS tBNA sample. When a lower PDL1 stain uh, result was used as a cutoff, there was very good uh, concordance between the results. But in those situations where a high test was regarded as positive, so more than 50% of cells uh, stained positive for PDL1, the sensitivity was less, it was 47%. And so that means that there, was, there were cases where the primary tumour had the this high positive uh, result, but the, but the EB, EBUS tDNA sample underrepresented it. This is a somewhat similar result uh, by Smith et al. from this year. They were looking at the possibility of performing EBUS tDNA PDL1 testing. And they, they were more concerned with the quality of the sample. And very importantly, they showed that the vast majority of samples did have very high uh, PDL, sorry, very high uh, malignant cell abundances, which meant that you, you were getting very um, reliable information from that sample. And in fact, most tests for that only require 100 cells, whereas in this paper, 63% of the samples had more than 500 cells. This is an interesting paper looking at an additional um, biomarker, so-called copy number alterations of PDL1 as, ass as assessed by uh, FISH. And there, there was an interesting sort of exploration of that as an alternative uh, test. But overall, once again, there was a concordance in the 60 to 70% mark with resected specimens. And at this stage, this, this paper uh, summarised where we're at with PDL1. Um, and it said, and the, the comment is that there's moderate concordance uh, with uh, PDL1 expression from histologic samples. So I think that we, most of us are using this. Um, and, and it will depend on how your own laboratories uh, interpret existing literature in terms of how they choose to report. Uh, but certainly because eBus tDNA is a go-to sample in so many patients, um, you know, we, we can nonetheless uh, use it uh, in the clinic at this time, understanding the, the caveats that I've mentioned. So that, that's all I had, and I would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. David Fielding, for an excellent talk on the role of IBUS in malignant mediastinal lymphadenopathy. So to give our next talk, we have Dr. Melvin Tay. He is a consultant and director of interventional pulmonology, Department of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, Singapore General Hospital, Singh Health, Duke NUS Lung Center. He is also working as a clinical assistant professor in the Duke NUS Medical School. He has got a special interest in critical care physiology, in general critical care medicine, as well as in uh, ECMO and interventional pulmonology. So today we have him with us to deliver a talk on the um, role of EBUS in benign mediastinal lymphadenopathy and update. Dr. Telvin, you can uh, share, Dr. Melvin Tay, you can share your uh, presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this uh, very kind invitation to attend this meeting. So the uh, topic that I'll be talking to you about today is uh, on EBUS, TBNA, and benign with spinal lesion. So I thought it would have been it would be useful for me to break down the objectives into three main uh, domains. Uh, first, I'd like to discuss with you some uh, benign etiologies that may be this, uh, diagnosed by EBUS, TBNA, their clinical uh, presentation, as well as some diagnostic caveats. And after which, uh, we'll evaluate the utility of EBUS tBNA in the diagnosis of common benign etiologies and uh, finish off with some selected interesting cases. So as we are well aware of, the indications uh, of EBUS tBNA can be broken down into three um, sections. Uh, so number one is the diagnosis and staging of non tumor cell lung cancer. EBUS tBNA is also very useful in uh, sampling endobronchial or peribronchial lesions. Uh, with regards to uh, endobronchial and peribronchial lesions, especially vascular lesions that are prone to bleeding. And uh, finally, it also can be used uh, to sample mediastinal lesions, uh, whether benign or malignant. So to answer the question of the common uh, etiologies, uh, benign etiologies that can be diagnosed uh, through EBUS-TBNA, 
I will be looking at a few studies. So um, in this study from um, uh, Chiba, Japan, so I looked at about 140 patients uh, who underwent EBUS TBNA for metastinomasis of unclear etiology. Basically, uh, these patients all did not have uh, a history uh, of uh, lung CA. And out of 140 patients, there were 100 benign uh, diagnoses. However, about nine of them um, uh, out of 140 were non-diagnostic on EBUS TBNA. So as you can see that uh, from the from the my slide, the EBUS overall uh, yield is about 93%, 93.6, and uh, the nine yield is about 96%. And all these patients uh, were followed up for one year because um, to ensure that the, uh, the the benign cases were indeed benign. And out of the final hundred uh, benign diagnoses, as you uh, the breakdown is as such, there were 55 sarcoid and then followed by uh, 20 cysts. And uh, it is important uh, to highlight that four out of 100 needed a second procedure after EBUS, uh, which diagnosed one goiter, one neurogenic tumor, and two non-specific inflammation. And moving on, uh, oh, sorry, uh, before we moved on, so just to recap, the top two benign causes in this Japanese series, sarcoid um, uh, was a 55%, followed by cyst, uh, which constituted another 20%. And uh, moving on, uh, we'll look at this uh, series uh, from Shanghai, China, published around the same time. Uh, and this uh, study looked at uh, patients who underwent EBUS TBNA for mediastinal lymphadenopathy or any mediastinal or hyalur lesion uh, of unclear etiology. So out of about 100 patients, the final diagnosis, as you can see that there's a market difference, there were only about uh, 38 benign as compared to the majority of the nine lesions uh, in the Japanese study. And uh, EBUS TBNA was uh, the diagnosis, uh, diagnosed 61 as malignant, but 40 as benign. So similarly, uh, similar to the Jap Japanese study, uh, the Chinese investigators also followed up these patients for about six months. Uh, and finally, out of uh, 38, eventual diagnosis of a benign disease. Uh, as you can see, the breakdown is as such, 14 granulomatous inflammation and followed by 13, uh, which was just uh, written off as uh, no evidence of malignancy. And then there was a scattered assortment of cases uh, from four sarcoid, four uh, tuberculosis and two miscellaneous. And I think um, it is important to highlight that two lymphomas were wrongly classified as benign. So to recap, uh, to summarize, uh, the top two benign causes in this Chinese study uh, was the granulometers inflammation followed by non-specific, and this constituted about 66% of the patients in this uh, series. So uh, the, the final study that we'll be discussing today uh, for this uh, section would be uh, the REM REMEDY trial, which was a prospective study uh, take, uh, that was conducted in five UK centers. So they only looked at patients with isolated uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and uh, there were about 77 patients, and the majority of the patients uh, were of uh, Asian uh, ethnicity, and out of uh, 77 patients, uh, 67 patients had the diagnosis achieved by EBUS TBNA, while the remaining 10 uh, needed a mediastinal stenoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. And uh, with regard uh, to uh, EBUS TBNA complications, um, it was uh, pretty unremarkable. It just had four, had transient desaturation, one had a minor bleeding, and, uh, the, and one had a fever. Uh, which uh, was uh, resulted in a total of five nights stay. Uh, however, this uh, is uh, taken into consideration, uh, must be taken into consideration uh, with regards to the fact that uh, all these are supposed to be day procedures, whereas uh, the 10 patients who underwent this diagnoscopy accumulated a total of 16 nights stay in the hospital. So as you can see from the uh, diagram uh, reflected on, on the slide, so there were um, there were 77 patients who underwent EBUS TBNA. Uh, about 10 of them had uh, non, no specific diagnosis uh, after EBUS TBNA and they underwent mediastinal stenoscopy. 
And subsequently, via uh, middle cyanoscopy, there were diagnoses made in about six. So um, two of them were sarcoidosis, two tuberculosis, and then two malignant, one lymphoma and one non-small cell lung cancer. And then out of 10, four of them had no specific diagnosis and they had to be followed up um, over a period of time, I think uh, one year, right, uh, to make sure that they had uh, clinical and radiological uh, stability. And uh, finally, the diagnosis was made uh, that uh, these four patients had uh, limb node uh, hyperplasia. Uh, as you can see from the slide as well, so uh, EBUS uh, achieved the pathological diagnosis in 67 patients. And uh, out of uh, and this 67 patients, 32 of them, uh, EBUS was able to diagnose 32 out of 34 sarcoidosis, 26 out of uh, 28 tuberculosis, uh, but uh, we have to take the con uh, we have to remember that all these diagnoses were made on uh, made on PAP alone. Uh, as you can see, uh, the TB uh, only out of 28 TB, only 11 were culture positive. And um, so the uh, take a take away message actually of this um, of this uh, paper uh, was actually that. Um, EBUS TBNA was actually a most cost-effective uh, first-line uh, therapy in the evaluation of isolated uh, mediastinoscopy as compared to mediastinoscopy. And uh, the overall sensitivity of EBUS TBNA in achieving the correct diagnosis uh, in the setting of a, an isolated uh, mediastinal limb fatinopathy, the sensitivity was about 92%. However, you can see that the, non, uh, the negative predictive value was only 40%. So in this case series, this uh, trial, uh, the top two benign causes, um, still sarcoid, 51.5%, uh, followed by TB. And I think uh, this is probably more reflective uh, of uh, what's, uh, the, the situation uh, in South Asia. So after going through uh, three uh, big uh, studies, so, what are the problems uh, with uh, EBUS TBNA in the diagnosis of benign diseases? In my opinion, I think there are a few issues. Okay, number one, um, the benign diseases are often not diagnosed just on PAP alone. So for example, TB as well as um, sarcoidosis, yeah, it's all about clinical, uh, radiological, and, uh, and in the case of TB, we need microbiological. Um, and the positive predictive value and to a lesser extent negative predictive value of EBUS TBNA in these uh, conditions, they are also affected by the disease prevalence. Uh, we have uh, seen, right, uh, in, even with amongst Asians, between, uh, amongst uh, Asians, between the Japanese, the Chinese, and then, uh, of course, uh, comparing this uh, with the Asians uh, in the UK, uh, there was actually a big difference in disease prevalence of all these benign conditions. And then, uh, even if assumed to be diagnostic, there's always that risk of, um, of fear, the risk of uh, missing a, a lung, uh, I mean a cancer, which is uh, something that is uh, fearful to all of us. So in the uh, Chinese study, we noted that two lymphomas were misdiagnosed as benign, but not stated as what. And because a lot of all these um, benign etiologies are made on the diagnosis of the finding, the pathological finding of granulomatous inflammation, um, this is particularly problematic because uh, granulomatous inflammation has got a long list of differential. And then the, what is exactly is non-specific inflammation, right? That is not sarcoid, not TB. What are they then, right? Uh, nobody really knows, but uh, all that we are sure is that we need time to tell. And therefore, the diagnosis cannot be made at a single time point. Uh, it has to be a longitudinal follow-up. And uh, you know, so far, uh, we have uh, the studies have chosen a arbitrarily, uh, you know, stability and no development of uh, malignancy uh, between six to twelve months of follow-up. And that brings me uh, to the end of my first section. And next, uh, we'll move on to the second section. The second section is uh, pretty simple. We're just going to go into greater detail, um, some discussion uh, on uh, common benign etiologies that are diagnosed on the EBUS TBNA. So um, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, granulometers, uh, inflammation, 
that is found on any lung or mediastinal limb node uh, specimen has got many different shows. So uh, before we move on, uh, let's go through the pathology, uh, pathology, I mean the pathology definition. So a granuloma is a focal aggregation of inflammatory cells, uh, usually made up of uh, epithelioid uh, histiocytes, uh, giant cells and lymphocytes. So when they say epithelioid histiocytes, they mean, uh, well, that is to say that uh, these are ill-defined cell borders, uh, they have ill-defined cell borders and uh, elongated nuclei as uh, compared to normal histiocytes, which have well-defined cell borders uh, and rounded nuclei. And it is important to note that uh, uh, plasma cells, uh, multinucleated giant cells, lymphocytes, uh, necrosis, they are not essential for granuloma formation. And uh, caseation uh, necrosis is uh, typically uh, eosinophilic and uh, granular and cheese-like. So this is a table uh, of the many different shows of granulomatous lung diseases. Um, broadly, they can be classified into infective and non-infective. So infective, the common ones are like mycobacterial, TB and NTM, uh, some fungal infections, then rarer uh, infections such as uh, syphilis, uh, Hansen's disease, tularemia, cat scratch disease, etc. And uh, with uh, regards uh, to the non-infective causes, uh, most commonly uh, that we encounter would be a sarcoid as well as a necrotizing uh, variant and um, vasculitis um, and allergen related uh, such as uh, granulomatosis uh, with polyangiitis. Uh, as well as uh, uh, hypersensitivity, uh, pneumonitis, uh, as well as uh, drug exposures or uh, heavy metals. And of course, even it doesn't mean that granulometers uh, inflammation is uh, representative of a non, uh, I mean, a benign a process uh, because there are malignancy that can also cause uh, granulometers inflammation. For example, a lot of tumors uh, have um, been reported to manifest a sarcoid-like reaction that, that can be confused with just uh, sarcoid granulomas. And of course, uh, uh, lympho lymphomatoid uh, granulomatosis can also uh, precipitate um, uh, granulometers inflammation. And therefore, sometimes, uh, you know, a sampling error can uh, occur, especially when uh, certain tumors are typically surrounded by granulometers inflammation, whereas the malignant cells are within the lesion. Uh, deeper down within the region itself. So let's um, assess the, uh, the literature um, of uh, EBUS, TBNA, and sarcoidosis. So I think uh, the most uh, well-known uh, piece of uh, evidence that we have is from the granuloma trial. Uh, this was a trial that was uh, conducted uh, in 14, across 14 European centers. Uh, they looked at about more than 300 patients with stage one and two sarcoidosis, uh, which uh, whom required some histological uh, confirmation. So what happened was that uh, the investigators uh, divided the patients uh, into two arms. So uh, one was uh, via bronchoscopy, uh, bronchoscopy methods, uh, which were just included uh, a TB, a transbronchial lung biopsy with uh, endobronchial biopsy versus the use of an uh, endo uh, ultrasound. Uh, and with this uh, endo ultrasound, it means that uh, the they were subject to either EUS right, or EBUS TBNA. Uh, however, uh, BAL was done for all patients, uh, and the trial found that, uh, found that the diagnostic yield of granulomas and sarcoidosis was superior uh, in the uh, endo ultrasound group um, that had a yield of about 80% as compared uh, to 53% in the bronchoscopy group. So, uh, however, it is important to note that uh, in this uh, trial, uh, the majority of uh, the uh, endosonography uh, method that they employed uh, was uh, primarily endoscopic uh, ultrasound and not uh, EBUS TBNA. So about 60% to about 36.36%. Uh, 36 so uh, naturally, uh, the bronchoscopy uh, arm uh, had more uh, adverse effects uh, than the um, out, uh, ultrasound arm. Uh, so uh, because TBLB itself uh, uh, it's, has got more complications, so such as uh, pneumothoraces uh, as well as uh, hemorrhage. So the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, um, it's 
it's not so simple, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it has to have the compatible uh, clinical radiologic features, and uh, it is important that we exclude disease mimickers. And, uh, you know, histopathology is not um, conclusive. Uh, basically, they are just supportive. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, finding the, find, the identifying uh, non caseating epithelioid granulomas uh, that have a bronchovascular. Uh, as well as a lymphovascular uh, um, distribution uh, would help to support the diagnosis. And it is important to also remember that in the rare cases or instances, uh, there may be a necrotizing sarcoid granulomas, uh, which are non caseating, uh, but uh, they are large and uh, highly vascular and is accompanied with a lot of parenchymal lung necrosis. So after sarcoidosis, um, you know, let's move on to TB lymphadenitis and the utility of uh, EBUS TBNA in this condition. So um, this uh, was a study done in Torex uh, and uh, basically published in Torex and it was uh, performed in the UK uh, that looked at about 156 patients with uh, isolated uh, intrathoracic uh, tuberculosis lymphadenitis over four years. So the diagnosis uh, had to be confirmed. Um, either by um, EBUS TBNA uh, or uh, there was some, uh, there was a unequivocal uh, clinical radiologic response to TB treatment during the follow up of at least six months for all these patients. So the um, uh, sensitivity of uh, the histology uh, was about 86%. Uh, uh, however, you just, uh, as you can see, the breakdown is a, it's a breakdown, it's a breakdown of um, you know, a granuloma with necrosis, granuloma only, and necrosis only. Whereas uh, in terms of uh, microbiology, uh, only 53% uh, 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 were dino uh, were had a microbiological uh, yield. Uh, 74 uh, of them uh, were culture positive and eight were AFB smear positive only. So um, the combined Diagnostic yield uh, for uh, EBUS TBNA in TB lymphadenitis uh, that uh, takes into consideration the histopath as well as the microbe is about 94 percent. And uh, closer to home, where I'm from, Singapore, uh, this was a study that was done in the in Australia, and they looked at 39 uh, EBUS TBNA specimens uh, that was positive for TB studies. Um, so, um, out of 39 uh, specimens, uh, 23 were, only 23 were culture positive, and one of them uh, was uh, nuclei acid amplification test positive. Uh, whereas uh, there were the remaining 12 uh, were the diagnosis was made uh, just based on granulometers inflammation only, and uh, like I've mentioned before, uh, this must be supported by uh, clinical radiologic or epidemiological evidence. So uh, in terms of histology, there were, they, the diagnosis was made um, in about 31%, while uh, microbiology, the yield, uh, diagnostic yield was about 62%, and combined, it was about 92%, which is uh, quite close uh, to the 94% uh, that was observed in the UK study. So um, as you can see, that uh, it's pretty problematic. Uh, that uh, in the diagnosis of um, EBUS TBN um, of benign uh, mediastinal um, lesions uh, using EBUS TBNA. Um, so, what about the uh, other features uh, of uh, ultrasound? Uh, could they be able to sort of help us uh, decide better on the, on how to approach this uh, problem? So. Uh, about 10 years ago, a decade ago, so um, the, the Japanese uh, already had uh, published this uh, study in chess uh, that looked at predictors of uh, malignant um, limb node uh, on the, the B mode EBUS. So uh, there were a few uh, features that uh, they have found. So, uh, for example, uh, the length of the short axis, if it's more than 10 mm, is more suggestive of um, a malignant limb node. Uh, Limb nodes which are rounded, uh, which have um, distinct margins, as well as a heterogeneous uh, consistency, they are also at a higher uh, have a higher risk of uh, being malignant. 
and the presence of a coagulation uh, necrosis sign, uh, which is defined as a hypoechoic area within the limb node that has got no blood flow, and the press, uh, and as well as the absence of a central hilus structure, uh, which is the uh, linear flat hypoechoic area uh, within the limb node. So. All these uh, features uh, are sort of like uh, predictors uh, that uh, the risk of um, malignancy would be high, higher uh, in the, in the uh, limb node that is being evaluated. Then um, the Taiwanese did uh, a study. So um, they actually look, use uh, you know, elastography on EBAS to see whether they could predict that the, uh, the limb node is likely to be malignant or uh, benign. So there were 94 patients, uh, they looked at 94 patients with unselected medial or medial spinal limb um, in Taiwan. And um, out of these 94 patients, uh, 70, so about 70% of them uh, had unclear etiology, while the remaining uh, were just uh, known cases of um, cancer, uh, either going, uh, and these patients were either going for uh, staging purposes or uh, rebiopsy. And uh, out of just 94 uh, patients, uh, 62, per, uh, 62 of them were eventually found to have uh, malign malignant disease, uh, whereas uh, 32 of them, which uh, constitutes about 30, 30, 34%, uh, were found to have uh, benign diseases. And as um, you can see from the slide, the breakdown of the benign uh, cases is somewhat different again. So there were seven, in this uh, series, there were 17 pneumonias, and then uh, followed by seven sarcoid, three pneumoconiosis, uh, you know, TB, there was only one, one case of TB, which is uh, pretty unusual. So, so what the study uh, tried to do uh, was that uh, they looked at uh, elastography. So um, let me go back to the previous slide. So um, for those of you who may not be familiar uh, with uh, elastography, so uh, you can see there are predominantly three patterns. So uh, the one on the top uh, right hand corner, you can see is type one. So it's predominantly non-blue, right? If it's predominantly non-blue, uh, it is uh, sort of uh, referred to as benign. And uh, if you look at the top uh, bottom right hand corner, you can see type three, which is predominantly blue. So these are firmer lymph nodes and they are uh, deemed to be malignant. And then uh, you have uh, the type 2, which is part non-blue, part blue, which is uh, in no man's land. So uh, let's uh, take a look at the results. So in this table, um, I would just like to, I know it's a busy slide, but I'd just like to focus your attention to three points. So number one, uh, in terms of um, patients with, that means that these patients were either uh, they only assess patients either type 1 or type 3. Type 1 means benign, type 3 uh, means uh, malignant. So in uh, elastography, uh, elastography, you can see that the diagnostic uh, yield was about 85% and the negative predictive value uh, was about 94.7%. All right. Um, and then um, with regards to the B modes, the, the uh, B modes are ultrasound. Uh, you can see that the only ones which actually uh, had some sort of diagnostic um, discrepancy uh, in terms of uh, uh, st statistical uh, significance uh, were only echogenicity as well as the margin. And uh, you can also appreciate from the table that the, in, with regards to these two features, the sensitivity as well as the specificity were both lower than elastography. And the negative predictive value of uh, these two features were also lower. So what does this mean? Um, so I think uh, the authors were trying to sell the point that elastography, you know, if, uh, if it's a clear cut type one or type three uh, elastography patterns, right, then uh, it is probably better than the uh, B-mode ultrasound features. However, as with uh, previous, uh, you know, the studies have shown whether you can predict uh, the likelihood of malignancy in, in these uh, lymph nodes or not, with, uh, whether you use a B mode uh, ultrasound or elastography, this does not uh, 
that means that uh, this is, does not mean that uh, you do not have to uh, do uh, you know, histological confirmation. So at the end of the day, I think uh, a lot of all these studies uh, and features are, in my opinion, probably more academic uh, than practical. And finally, um, we're running out of time, so uh, we'll be just running through a few cases which uh, uh, I got from a, an article that was published by, by uh, this uh, pulmonologist from uh, Chile. So uh, case one, uh, so she's a 52-year-old uh, woman and she had a chronic non-productive cough and uh, dysphagia to solids. And the C chest CT showed that there was a 30 by 26 mm left paratracheal mass uh, that uh, you can see here, okay? And uh, on EBUS TBNA, you can see that it was an anechoic uh, lesion and the, the, when, we then, when they performed EBUS TBNA using a 21 gauge needle, the aspirator was uh, 200 mils of thick mucus. The cytology returned as normal ciliated bronchial epithelial cells, no um, isolated organisms. So what do you think is the diagnosis? So anyway, there's no um, live audience or rather no live audience uh, answer. This is a benign, uncomplicated bronchogenesis. So uh, as uh, one of the earlier uh, series, the Japanese series, after sarcoidosis, the Japanese found that uh, the uh, cysts were the mo second most uh, common uh, benign disease that were diagnosed, uh, that was diagnosed on EBUS TBMA. Moving on to case two. So this was a 63-year-old uh, woman who was uh, referred for evaluation of a right peribronchial lesion on chest CT. And uh, the tissue that was obtained by EBUS TBMA showed uh, it, uh, for amorphous uh, eosinophilic material and then uh, had a positive uh, stain on the red Congo and uh, polarized uh, light microscopy also showed a uh, yellow-green birefringin. So what is the diagnosis? Okay, yeah, so um, this was a case of a localized uh, amyloidosis type AA. And moving on to case three, uh, this is pretty interesting in my opinion. So it's a middle-aged gentleman, chronic smoker, uh, presented with chronic cough. And on the chest CT showed a left upper lobe nodule um, just below uh, two centimeters uh, that was adjacent to the left upper lobe takeoff. And on EBUS TBNA, the histology was fibrous tissue. Yeah, and uh, there were some nuclear pleomorphism and uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Of course, in this patient who is at, at is high risk, so, um, you know, even though the uh, EBUS TBNA findings were non malignant, uh, I don't think uh, the um, physician, the primary physician, was going to take the chance of, um, of missing a cancer. So, a patient underwent a surgery. Um, because of uh, the risk, uh, as mentioned, and the histology, uh, histology showed uh, the same findings. So what is this? So on histology, they found spindle-shaped cells in uh, fascicles on the background of abundant uh, inflammatory cells, uh, and this is an inflammatory pseudotumor. And finally, for the the uh, finishing case, uh, this is a 60-year-old woman who is uh, immunocompromised uh, because she has got a history of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and uh, underwent a bone marrow transplant. Uh, so she presented with a paroxysm of unknown origin and co chronic cough. And on chest CT, uh, there was a close to 5 centimeters uh, heterogeneous mass, uh, which was very uh, vascular internally, that was arising from the lingula. So um, flexible bronchoscopy was performed, BAL2, and uh, EBUS TBNA of the mass. So uh, it is uh, important to highlight uh, this point. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the physicians in this case, uh, they probably opted, um, I mean, uh, in this um, article, I, I think uh, there was no uh, corresponding CT thorax, but even if uh, you know it, uh, the lesion could be reached by transbronchial lung biopsy, you know because of the internal vascularity, uh, they opted for EBUS TBNA, which I think uh, was a very wise decision. So, what was the diagnosis? So, uh, in the previous, in the previous, uh, in this slide, you can see uh, appreciate that there are a lot of filamentous, branch-like looking organisms. And on higher power, you see this, right? 
So you know, gram-positive uh, branching filamentous organisms um, with, with cultures that grew no cardia. So with that, uh, I think uh, I'll close the session uh, and um, I'll hand it over to the chairperson. Thanks, Dr. Melvin Tay, for an excellent talk on uh, EBUS and benign mediastinal lesions. So to move on to the next talk and to introduce our speakers, we have uh, Professor J.C. Turi. Sir is the head and uh, uh, consultant in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Fortis Vasan Kunj, Delhi. And uh, Sir will be introducing our next speakers. Thank you, Dr. Vishwesh. It's my privilege to introduce the next two speakers. The first speaker would be Dr. Paul Frost Clementson. He is the senior scientist at Copenhagen Academy for Medical Education and Simulation. He is a clinical research associate professor at the Department of Clinical Medicine, Copenhagen University, consultant at Department of Internal Medicine, Zealand University Hospital, Roskilde, Denmark. The speaker, uh, to his credit, has 190 publication with more than 30 in the H index journal. He has a special interest on both the diagnosis and staging of lung cancer with endoscopic ultrasound and simulation-based training in respiratory medicine, including assessment of competencies in bronchoscopy and other procedures using endoscopic ultrasound, EBUS and EUSB. In the staging and diagnosis of lung cancer with endoscopic ultrasound with special focus on respiratory insufficiency, for example, chronic obstructive lung disease. He will be joined by our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ida Skovgaard Christiansen. She is a PhD fellow at Department of Internal Medicine, Zealand University Hospital, Roskilde, Denmark, and University of Copenhagen, Denmark. The speaker has about 14 publications. In her clinical research, Dr. Ida Skovgaard Christiansen focuses on the diagnosis and staging of lung cancer with endoscopic ultrasound, especially the EUSB procedures. She is currently, currently working on her PhD thesis, which is about the endoscopic workup of lung cancer. I invite both of them to deliver an interactive talk on the topic EUSB FNA, what a pulmonologist should know. My name is uh, Ida Skovo Christiansen. And, and my name is Paul Frost Clemsen, and uh, I'm a pulmonologist. And uh, Ida is, is um, writing her PhD thesis in our center. And we are going to present for you uh, USB FNA how can it be used in lung cancer? And we will shift during the presentation. So Ida will tell you something and I'll tell you something and maybe we'll have some questions uh, for each other and Ida will start. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So EUSB FNA in lung cancer, uh, what the pulmonologist should know. As I understood, some of you are already working in the field of the diagnosing lung cancer, but some of you might not have direct experience yet. So I'm going to talk, uh, start by telling you a bit of the background in the diagnosing of lung cancer and endoscopic ultrasound. Then I will continue to uh, the EUSB FNA procedure um, and, to and tell you what we know about how it can be used in the TNM classification. Then uh, Professor Clemerson will uh, tell you how to perform the procedure and how to learn it. I will start with uh, an example. Um, and this should be kind of familiar to you because this is a chest CT. Um, and this is very often how the lung cancer workup starts because uh, it is uh, your job as pulmonologists to find out what is it that you see here uh, and how can we treat the patient. And in order to find out this uh, in the diagnostic workup of lung cancer, there are several answers, the questions we need to answer. First of all, we need to answer, is it cancer? If it is cancer, we need to find out, out what type of cancer is it and what stage. Uh, in the staging of lung cancer, we use the TNM classification, describing the tumor, the lymph nodes and the metastases. Based on the TNM classification, we make the treatment decision. The reason that um, 
the exact uh, classification is so important in lung cancer and especially non-small cell lung cancer is that uh, surgery is only possible with very localized disease. So in uh, this schematic figure, you see a, a lung tumor uh, within a dotted circle. And it is only if the spreading of the tumor is within the dotted circle that surgery is possible. So how do we answer the questions that I just mentioned? Well, tissue is the issue, as you say, we need tissue samples. And mostly we need tissue samples from mediastinal lymph nodes, and we need tissue samples of all suspicious lesions. There are several ways uh, to obtain these tissue samples. Uh, and as you see here, uh, uh, there is a left-sided lung tumor, um, and uh, different techniques in which you can uh, biopsy uh, the lesion. And the best way depends on where the lesion is localized. Today our focus is the endoscopic ultrasound. Um, and the endoscopic ultrasound procedures, as you know, can be either be performed through the airways, it is then called EBUS, or through the esophagus, it is then called EUS. EBUS uh, is known to gain access to the structures close to the large airways, and EUS gains access to structures close to the esophagus and just below the diaphragm. As you see here, some structures can be reached by one of the procedures and some structures can be reached by both the procedures. So the two procedures are complementary. The European guidelines for combined endosonography for the diagnosis and staging of lung cancer recommend a combination of EBUS and EUS or EUSB for the TNM classification as the combination of the two procedures is superior to each procedure alone. But as EUS is not an option in many centers, uh, the procedure called EUSB has been gaining ground. To put it very shortly, uh, EUSB, the, the EUSB procedure uh, means to perform the EUS procedure using the EBUS endoscope. This makes it possible for the pulmonologist to perform a combination of the two procedures using only one endoscope. As EUSB FNA is a rather new procedure, the literature is growing. And uh, in the next section of the talk, I will take you through um, what we know about how EUSB FNA can be used in every step of the TNM classification. I will start with the tumor. Um, and in the European guideline, uh, EUS FNA or EUS B FNA of a centrally located lung tumor is recommended if the tumor is located adjacent to the esophagus. As you see in these pictures, uh, to the left you have a CT scan where you can see a, a lung tumor located close to the esophagus. And in the right panel, uh, you see the EUS picture um, where the needle is uh, puncturing the uh, tumor. EUSB has also been found to be able to uh, reach uh, these centrally located lung tumors. <coughs> um, it has been shown in uh, several smaller studies. And in one of our own studies, we found um, that EUSB FNA increased diagnostic yields when added to bronchoscopy and EBUS from 51% to 90%. The study was a retrospective study, so you should take the numbers with caution, but remember that adding another procedure, a transesophageal uh, procedure to bronchoscopy and EBUS increased the chance of uh, getting a tissue sample from a centrally located lung tumor. Uh, also in connection to the T category, uh, potentially the endoscopic ultrasound itself, meaning the endoscopic uh, ultrasound image itself can be used to um, distinguish the anatomic relationship between the centrally located lung tumor and the blood vessels. In a recent publication, uh, it was shown that EUS increased the sensitivity of T4 tumors compared to CT alone. 
This has not been investigated for EUSB uh, yet, but I would say that it is uh, very probable that this could also be the case for EUSB. So this was the T category, and I'm now moving on to the N category for lymph nodes. Uh, first of all, um, this figure illustrates the importance of distinguishing the different lymph node stations in the lung cancer workup. In the figure, you see a right-sided lung tumor and the different lymph node stations. The dotted lines uh, indicate uh, the consequence of spreading to the different lymph node stations in the situation with this tumor. So spreading to the um, left panel, um, no, sorry, right side <laughs> would mean N1 disease. Uh, and that would mean that the patient could have surgery spreading to the middle section would mean N2 disease, and that would mean don't do surgery. Spreading to the left side would mean N3 disease, and that would mean absolutely don't do surgery. Keeping this in mind, in this figure you see um, all the different uh, lymph nodes that has been shown to be reachable by EUSB FNA. Some of them very commonly, some of them only in a few cases. As you see, EUSB FNA can reach um, the uh, superior mediastinal lymph nodes, the subcarinal station 7, and the left HeLa station 10L which are all also reachable by EBUS. Additionally, EUSB can reach station 3P and the, the inferior mediastinal stations uh, 8 and 9, which are not reachable by uh, EBUS. So uh, EUSB can help identify both N1, 2 and 3 disease, but most commonly, uh, it can identify N2 and N3 disease. So what do we know from the literature? Um, in a recent uh, prospective systematic study, EUSB uh, was added to systematic EBUS and was found to increase the sensitivity in the mediastinum. And uh, below, in a, a systematic review from 2017, including studies where EUS and EUSB was, uh, were added to EVOS, both procedures were found to increase the sensitivity in the mediastinum, and there wasn't um, found any differences between the EUS uh, and the EUSB procedures. So to repeat, uh, what I said about the guidelines uh, earlier, a combination of uh, EBUS and EUSB is recommended in the uh, mediastinal uh, workup because uh, the combination of the two procedures is superior to each procedure alone. And that was the N category <coughs> and I will now move on to the M for metastasis. And first of all, it is important that you remember that any M uh, below, uh, above uh, M0 would mean stage 4 disease and that the patient can't have surgery. So therefore, it is crucial in the workup of lung cancer to rule in or out malignancy in all uh, suspicious lesions that could be a metastasis. In the, in the next section, I'm going to show you different structures that can be reached with EUSB FMA and uh, what uh, it means for the M category. And the first situation is, um, as illustrated here, the situation where you have more than one tumor nodule. So here you see a, a right-sided lung tumor in the uh, lower lobe. And there are additional um, nodules, and depending on the location of the nodules, the stage is either T3, 4, or M1A. So, of course, is if EUSB FNA can reach any of the, the nodules, well, then it has helped. Um, 
identifying which stage it is. Moving on, still in the M1A category, which in general covers um, metastases within the chest, we have the pleural effusion. And as you see here, um, a pleural effusion can be reached by EUSB at the FNA, as illustrated here in the schematic drawing. I have a short question here, if I may interrupt you. Sure. <clears throat> I think this is very interesting. Normally, I think people do a pleurosynthesis from the outside with transtherapy, also some. That is how I have done it for many years. And now you suddenly tell us that we can do a pleurosynthesis with EUSB. Why should I shift to this uh, method instead of doing pleurosynthesis as we have all been doing for many years? Well, thank you for that excellent question. Um, and of course, plural effusions uh, are very common uh, and mostly you should continue to do as uh, you used to. But there are a few situations um, where it would be relevant to consider um, doing it uh, with EUSB FNA. The first situation is the situation where the fluid, fluid is localized uh, close to the esophagus uh, and not being reachable uh, percutaneously. Then you could do it, of course. Um, another situation where you could consider um, puncturing the pleural effusion with EUSB FNA could be if the patient already is having a combined EBUS and EUSB performed. So if you're already there and you can see the fluid, you can puncture the fluid and then you could spare the patient for uh, another percutaneous procedure. Okay. So that could be the situations, but otherwise, uh, of course, you should do as you, you used to. Most so of normally them. we should do the pleurosynthesis as we have done for many years, sure. transthoracic. Yeah. <clears throat> but in, in, in certain situations where the fluid is close to the esophagus or the stomach, we can do it from the inside. Yeah. And then there's this practical, very elegant thing that we are doing with the USB anyway. So why shouldn't we take out the fluid when we are inside the patient? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Okay. Moving on to um, another M1A uh, location, we have a pleural nodule. Uh, and as you see in this example, uh, we have uh, to the left a um, PET CT with uh, a pleural nodule that was punctured using EUSB FNA. Um, and if you think of the, the questions we just had before, this situation uh, very often could also be relevant relevant to, to, to do percutaneously, but as you see here, the location of the lesion is closer to the esophagus than uh, to the surface of the skin. So again, in this situation, it could um, be more helpful to do it um, with EUSB FNA. So this lesion is uh, very easy to reach from the esophagus, mm. but may be difficult to reach uh, transthoracic. So in yeah. this situation, you would say we should do EUSB? Yeah. Okay. That gives sense when we look at the PET CT. Yeah. Um, the last uh, example I will show you of an M1A location if the, is the pericardial effusion. And this example is from a recent case report where a, a patient presented with a lesion in the left lung and a pericardial effusion. And as you see to uh, the right side, the pericardial effusion was punctured using EUSB FNA. And in the fluid, there was found to be uh, adenocarcinoma of pulmonary origin, looking exactly the same as um, the pulmonary lesion. So this patient was diagnosed with lung cancer and upstaged to M1A disease because of the pericardial effusion. So with one puncture of the needle, we did have a diagnosis at the stage. But we also punctured the lesion, as okay. I remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I'm moving on to the extrathoracic metastases. And if there is uh, one, it is uh, M1B disease. If there are several, it is M1C. Uh, and of course, uh, these can be anywhere in the body. And I'm only going to tell you about what we can reach with EUSB FNA, that being the structures below the diaphragm. Um, and first, and maybe most established, we have the left adrenal gland. This is a very common site for masses where uh, malignancy needs to be ruled in or out during the lung cancer workup. It is well known that the left adrenal gland can be reached by EUS. 
but it can also be reached by a USB. Um, in a systematic study from 2017, um, where they compared uh, EUS and EUSB FNA of left adrenal gland, it, the EUSB FNA was found to have uh, equal diagnostic qualities as EUS. This has later been supported in several other publications, um, and many of these publications suggest that um, EUSB FNA of the left <coughs> adrenal gland should be uh, incorporated into the routine diagnostic uh, workup with systematic uh, EBUS and EUSB. Okay, so moving on to the next um, structure that can be biopsied with uh, EUSB FNA. This is the liver and the, the sites in the liver that can be reachable by EUSB is of course the central uh, parts uh, to the left side close to the esophagus. Uh, as you see an example on here, this is a lesion that was biopsied using EUSB FNA. Had this been a lung cancer, it would have been M1B disease. However, um, it turned out to be a metastasis from a malignant melanoma. So you can also find unexpected uh, things when you do this. The next example um, that can be reached with EUSB is ascites. Here you see um, again a CT scan where you have a, a, a small amount of uh, ascites and to the right you see that it was punctured using EUSB FNA. And the last example of structures below the diaphragm is the um, retroperitoneal lymph nodes. This example is from a patient who presented with uh, coughing and enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. And this lymph node uh, below the diaphragm, uh, this retroperitoneal lymph node was uh, biopsied using EUSB uh, FNA. Um, and together with the other um, biopsies, the patient was diagnosed with uh, sarcoidosis, so it didn't turn out to be lung cancer, but had it been lung cancer, it would have been M1B disease. <laughs> to sum up, before I give the word to Professor Clemenson, as you see here, EUSB FNA can reach a lot of structures in the chest and below the diaphragm, and it can uh, help diagnose lung cancer uh, in any, every step of the TNM classification. I think uh, USB is a part of the future, at least when we diagnose and stage patients with lung cancer. But I have one question that I have been asked several times, and I'm not sure I can answer it myself. But you know, in, in, in some departments, or many departments, at least in our department, we have a large EUS endoscope that we have learned to use as pulmonologists, even if uh, the gastric surgeon started with it, and we have the smaller EBUS endoscope, and now you have told us the advantages of using the small EBUS endoscope in the esophagus. So my question is, when I have access to both endoscopes, what endoscope should I choose? Is there any evidence that I should choose one endoscope over the other for the esophagus? Well, that is a very good question. Um, of course, we should ask, uh, we should ask uh, what uh, does the evidence say? And as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, the evidence we have um, is, for instance, uh, a systematic review where uh, EUS and EUSB uh, were, were found to have equal diagnostic uh, sensitivity in the mediastinum. And we have the study I mentioned about the left adrenal gland, where EUS and uh, EUSB were also found to have the uh, same uh, diagnostic qualities. So from the literature, it seems that the two procedures are equal um, in the work of lung cancer, at least. And um, so I would say that if you think about the logistic and practical uh, advantages of uh, using one endoscope instead of two endoscopes. Um, I would recommend that uh, in many situations we use the EUSB. Uh, but if you have a very tall patient with a large left adrenal, mm. should I then take the large endoscope to be sure that I can reach the adrenal or is it equal? Well, um, you could think that, um, but from the literature, again, the studies I mentioned, uh, several of the studies actually <coughs> mentioned that 
the height of the patient didn't influence uh, on whether or not it could be reached with the USB. So, well, it's very plausible to think like you do, but we don't have any uh, evidence that it should be like that. Uh, and it's some of the studies are from the Netherlands uh, who have very tall people and they didn't find it a problem. No, uh, when we started EOS uh, some years ago, we tried to teach the pulmonologists to use the big EOS endoscope in the esophagus. And some pulmonologists said, okay, let's try it. <clears throat> because we think that the US in the school is better, um, you can send water and air down and you can move the needle and take biopsies and the ultrasonic picture is better. So we recommended them to use the US in the school. And some of them uh, took it and learned it. But the main problem was that the pulmonologist said, uh, we know the EBUS in the school, but we don't know the US in the school. Then we said, Let's try to use the eposcope in the esophagus. And then the pulmonologist said, okay, let's do that. We know the eposcope, we feel safe with using it. So now everybody, not everybody, but quite many pulmonologists use the epos endoscope in the esophagus. So I think one more advantage is that you can tell the pulmonologist to use the epos endoscope in the esophagus and they will do it. They will not use the big US endoscope. So you say there's a mental barrier towards yes, the US? Exactly, the that's my point. I think at least in Denmark or in Western Europe, there's a mental barrier for using the big US endoscope that the pulmonologists do not know in the esophagus. They know the EBUS endoscope and they're willing to use it in the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we go on with something I will yeah. say? Yeah. Well, now I'll tell you how we perform USB. And uh, first we do a bronchoscopy, then we do an EBUS procedure and the patient is lying on the back. And then we shift to the esophagus with the EBUS endoscope. It's not very difficult just to encourage the patient to swallow and then move the EBUS endoscope in the esophagus and do EOSB. When we do EOSB or EOS uh, to find our way, we have six landmarks. And we have published it several times and we use these landmarks in a validated test when we test if people are able to do the procedure. The point is you should find these six landmarks and every time you lose your way or you are in doubt where am I, you can go back to one of these landmarks and you should find the landmarks in this order. First you go below the diaphragm and you turn the endoscope and you find the liver. And the liver is quite easy to find. And when you see the liver, you at least know that you are no longer in, in the trachea, in the airways, you must be in the esophagus. So start by finding the liver. Then you turn the endoscope, the transducer, uh, to the abdominal aorta. And when you have found the abdominal aorta, you can recognize it's the abdominal aorta with the Doppler, or you can find the, the celiac trunk and the superior mesentery artery. The abdominal aorta is quite easy to find. Then you turn the transducer to the left side of the patient, and you look for the left adrenal gland. That is the third landmark. Then you retract the endoscope and go into the mediastinum, and you find station seven, which is located between the right pulmonary artery and the left atrium. And, and the very good thing by knowing these landmarks is that you find them independent of the endoscopic view. When you are in the esophagus, there's no point in trying to look at the endoscopic picture because there's no uh, carina and subcarina, of course. You have only uh, this small red uh, picture and you're helpless when you look at the endoscopic picture. So you should find station seven between the right pulmonary artery and the left atrium. Then you retract the endoscope and between uh, the arch of the aorta and the left pulmonary artery, you find station 4L. Then you retract the endoscope a little bit more and you find the uh, acyclase vein. And when the acyclase vein disappears into the superior cable vein, you can find station 4R. It's discussed if you can find station 4R. Our experience is that it can be difficult to find. Uh, my personal experience is that it should be more than one centimeter uh, if you should find station 4R. But the point is, 
when you do AOSB, find the six landmarks in this order. Then later you can, you can look at uh, other structures and search for the structures that uh, Ida told you about, but find the six landmarks in this order. Now it comes, it becomes a little more complicated, but uh, because when you take the biopsies, you should use another order. You should start with M1B disease, for example, uh, biopsy the left arena. Then you switch to M3 disease. And in this case, where you have a right-sided lung tumor, you could biopsy station 10L or station 4L. Then you switch to M2 disease and biopsy station 7 and 4R. And then you switch to M1, 10R, and then you can biopsy the lung tumor. And this order is to prevent you from upstaging the patient accidentally. Uh, you can say it another way, if you started with a lung tumor and then had cancer cells in the needle, and then you went all the way to the left arena and you brought some cancer cells to the left arena, and the pathologist would say, I have found cancer cells in the left arena. So that's wrong, but the right way is to go this way around. So one order is find the landmarks in the correct order to be sure you do systematically and you can find your way. And the other order is when you take the biopsies, do it in this order. I don't hear any questions from the audience. Uh, maybe it's because it's a movie. It's so self-explanatory. Yeah. It is, okay. okay. But uh, I think now we should ask each other, how can we learn USB? Now we have heard that uh, USB and EBUS should be combined. That is what uh, is said in the European guidelines. And Ida has told about uh, the many advantages of doing AOSB in combination with EBUS when you want to diagnose and uh, stage a lung cancer patient. How can we learn AOSB? Maybe we could ask in another way, how can we learn EBUS? The EIS uh, has, the European Respiratory Society has a program, a structured training program for learning EBUS. And this is how it looks. Part one, you learn the theory. We have courses with around 60 participants each time. Uh, two or three day courses with lectures and, uh, and demonstrations of uh, the procedures. The theory can be learned by reading uh, literature and participating in uh, this theoretical course and it ends with a theoretical test. Part two is that we divide these 60 participants uh, and they go to different countries, uh, two to each center once a month. They go to, for example, Heidelberg in Germany or Amsterdam in the Netherlands or Copenhagen in Denmark where we work. And they uh, participate in a two or three day course where they will be trained in a simulator in EBUS for two days and this training will end with a practical validated test and on day three uh, the participants will go to a center where both EBUS and USB is performed and the participants can kind of watch the procedures. Part three is that when you come home you should upload movies of uh, your own patients upload these movies and uh, we will look at the movies. We will look if you can find the six landmarks in the correct order and we'll look at how you take biopsies. And again, after part three, there's a test. And if you pass the test in part one, the test in part two, and the test in part three, you have learned how to do EBUS and you can go on with the training uh, in the patients. So step one, theory plus a test. Step two, simulation based training plus a test. And part three, clinical training and a test. Theory, I cannot go through all the theory here. I can just show you some examples. One very important thing when you look at the anatomy in the mediastinum is that you know the border between station 4R and 10R. If you, for example, have a right-sided lung tumor, either just told you that uh, 
if there are malignant cells in station 10R, the patient can be operated. If there are malignant cells and it's a non-small cell lung cancer and the malignant cells are located in station 4R, the patient cannot be operated. What is the border between station 10R and 4R? It's the lower border of the azygos beam. It's very, very important to know that. Another example, theory is that the border between station 4L and station 10L is the upper border of the left pulmonary artery. And if you do not know these borders and you biopsy, for example, station 10L and you think it's 4L, then you can upstage the patient. But now the headline was, and I know that Ida is eager to ask me, uh, could you please tell me about USB, how to learn this? Um, well, when we look at EBUS, we have this training program. It's more difficult when we look at USB, but one very important thing is that we know that no patient wants to be a part of a learning curve. This is the clinical training, and this is when we train people in the simulators. You cannot be an expert when you only train in a simulator. You should go on with the clinical, uh, clinical training afterwards. This is an example of uh, EBUS simulator. I'm not going in detail, but as you can see on this picture, there are many ways to look at the media steinum. You can remove the heart, you can remove the vessels, you can go through a CT scan. And on the left picture, you can see station 4L located between the arch of the aorta and the left pulmonary artery, the so-called Mickey Mouse window. So in the simulator, we can train you in finding the six landmarks and we can train you in taking the biopsies. Does this help? Does it work? Yes, it does. We have made a randomized study, and in short, when simulation-based training in EBUS was added to clinical training, uh, the participants performed better when we did uh, when we made movies of them, of them, anonymized videos of the procedure in real patients. So there's evidence that uh, that simulation-based training is better than clinical training alone. But how can we learn USB? Well, there's no training program uh, yet. There's only a training program in EBUS. There's no simulator for USB. There's a simulator for EBUS, and we hope, of course, that one day the simulator will also contain an USB module. We have a protocol for a PhD project, and we hope to perform this project and show that uh, simulation-based training in EUSB is better than clinical training alone. So this is an overview over what we have for EPUS, and we hope to put in also EUSB in this training program. So this was in short how we can learn endosonography, I would say. Any questions? Or? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, as you said, there isn't any training program for EUSB yet, but how would you recommend uh, me to start performing EUSB? If there is no simulator, how, how should I do it? Um, so the question is, how can we learn EUSB when there's no training program? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good question. But one thing is that we recommend that people start by learning from Cosmic. You have to know the anatomy and, and, and you have to be able to find your way in the bronchial tree to go on with the more advanced procedures. First of all, learn from hospital. And we have simulation-based training programs in, the, in that also. Step two is to learn EBUS and I think ideally you should participate in the, in the training program that the European Respiratory Society has launched. And in part one, the surgical part, you also learn about EUSB. You know, the anatomy in the mediastinum, whatever you do for procedure, you should know the anatomy in the mediastinum and the lungs. So in part one, the surgical part, you learn what you should learn uh, to, to perform an USB procedure. In part two, when you visit our centers, you'll not only see EPOS, you'll also see USB procedures. So uh, if you want to learn USB, unfortunately, when you come to the practical part where you will do the procedure yourself, you have to train on patients, meaning that you will have to find another doctor that has experience or has uh, 
practiced AOSB from some, for some time, and then you would stand beside him and see how the procedure is done. Then later you would take over the endoscope, and under his or her uh, supervision, you would do the procedures. But only until we have the EOSB module in our EPUS simulator. That was a long answer for a short question. Did it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. We are now coming to the end of our talk. Um, in the end, I will give our take home messages. First of all, EPUS and EUSB are complementary. Very important. Yeah. Uh, EUSB contribute uh, to every step of the TNM classification of lung cancer. And maybe most importantly, do not forget the esophagus in lung cancer workup.